some measure of goodness of fit, where n is the number of observations that you have, and sigma square is the sum of weighted squared residuals divided by the number of observations. And then they all have uh, some sort of penalty term for the number of parameters that you estimate. And so k is the number of hydraulic parameters that you're trying to estimate in your model, plus 1 because we're also estimating sigma squared. Now this looks empirical, but it's got a theoretical basis. And let me just mention low values are better. We won't talk a whole lot more about AIC or its underpinnings. And that there are alternatives, as I mentioned, such as AIC, BIC, KIC. They can also be used in the same way that I talk about here, and the essence of the result will be quite similar. So let's look at the AIC values for our thermometer example. We might have the mean to represent that data. We know they don't like that. There's the straight line, and let me step through the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth order polynomials, and then look at the AIC values, and you can see the linear model is clearly the winner, but the next two order polynomials aren't bad. They were close to a straight line anyway, but the models that are not very good representations, the mean and the sixth order polynomial, are clearly uh, unacceptable given your AIC measure. So if we take our groundwater models and we order them by their AICC, we can compare their weighted mean square prediction error to their quality of calibration. So decreasing quality of calibration is to the right. And this is a little disappointing because we were hoping to see a nice 45 degree cloud moving up this curve. And instead, we find that we have some well calibrated models that do a good job of predicting, but they don't always do as good a job of predicting as the poorly calibrated models. And there are some well calibrated models that don't do a very good job of predicting at all. And this happens no matter which measure you use and even for other model systems. It's very common because the calibration data do not always reflect what the prediction is dependent on. So generally we'd like to use the best calibrated model to make our prediction, but we can't know that that's the best predictor. And so a way out of this dilemma is to look at multiple models, calibrate them, and multi-model average their results. So how do we do this multi-model averaging? We take our parsimony criterion, in this case AIC, and we look at our models and we say, well, there's the model that shows up as the best. We'll use that as the minimum. We take the AICC values from all the other models and subtract the minimum from it, and it gives us a delta value, which is actually uh, information loss on a log scale. So when we want to determine a weight for each model, we can take e to the minus 0.5 times a delta value, normalize that for the sum of all those for every model, and these will then sum to 1. It will give us a weight for each model. Uh, sometimes people have prior probabilities on their model based on other information. And if they'd like to incorporate that in this process, they can simply add that prior probability to this calculation. So if we look at the model weights for the thermometer, we see the linear model shows up very strongly as the highest weighted model, 80% here. And if we look at the weights for our various flow system models, you can see there's a number of them that have fairly significant weight, and then it trails off to very low weights out here. So how do we use the weights? Well, we can get a model average prediction by taking the weight for each model times its prediction and summing them up. It gives us a model average prediction. And then if we want a model average standard deviation, we weight the combination of the individual model variance, which we talked about calculating earlier, and then the between model variance, the prediction of this model minus the model average prediction. And then, well, we've squared the standard deviation here and the between model deviation here. So we have a variance. We weight that by the weight for each model, take the square root of it to get the standard deviation, and if we've been reasonable about evaluating the scope of conceptual models that we can develop given the data of our site, then we are beginning to capture this large blue confidence interval. So let's look at the results for our groundwater models. If we look at the prediction of drawdown at the well in the south, we can see that the, quote, best model, the one with the lowest AIC, was pretty close to the truth and included the truth in its confidence intervals. If we multi-model average, you might be a little upset with me because the value actually moves away from the truth and the confidence intervals get wider, and, and that will certainly happen at times. But it's not the only thing we wanted to predict about this model. What about flow rate to the tributary? We look at the best model and find out that 
Its confidence intervals don't even include the truth. But when we multi-model average, we do include the truth. And if we look at the position of the plume after five years of pumping, again, the best model doesn't include the truth. The multi-model average values do. And there's even a model that predicted that the plume would be way to the east, but its weight was so small that it didn't influence the overall model averaged uncertainty. Now we can even model average the exit location. So if we trace the center of mass, we find that 15 of them go to our municipal well, which is, we know the truth, 24 of them end up at the remedial well. And if we look at the plume as a whole, we can see that in some models it splits and goes partly to one well and partly to another, and sometimes entirely to one well or the, not the other. But we can multi-model average the paths of this plume, and we will find that in this case, there's a 52% chance that the spill is going to exit at the municipal well. And now we've finally been honest with our community. Instead of coming in and saying everything's fine or everything's not fine, we've said, well, there's a lot of uncertainty involved in this calculation. And given the data that we have now, there's a 52% chance that the spill will end up at the municipal well. Then the community can decide whether they want to go ahead with the project and take that risk. Do they want to abandon the project altogether and come up with something else? Do they want to spend more money to make a more elaborate evaluation, perhaps collect more data? So they're left in the position where they now have the information about what we know on the system and they get to decide rather than just letting the model come up with a number and the model decides. So if we look at that example near Copenhagen, we find that the three models that they had had weights of 26, 69, and 5%, which I was quite impressed by because oftentimes when people make multiple models of their site, one model will come up with a percentage of 99.99 and the others will be insignificant. So clearly they have a good idea of the possible ways that their system might be connected. And if we look at the multi-model averaging of those results, we find that this is what they could show the public and use for discussion. They can use the red lines here. So they have a prediction for every year and a confidence interval. They don't have to explain three models at once. And you can see how sometimes the confidence intervals will actually be outside those of each individual model. And sometimes they will re eliminate the confidence intervals that are calculated by one individual model. So now you've multi-model average prediction and you have a way of integrating those multiple conceptual models. If we look at that site near Los Angeles, one of the issues there was what does the source function look like? So that was included uh, in this case with just one flow model and the parameters of the source function were estimated and then the models were weighted. So here's the four different suggested source functions and their confidence intervals and then the weights here you can see this one was uh, the far more likely than the others. So when you do the multi-model averaging, the final example source function looks like uh, more like that distribution than any of the others. So there are many possible alternative conceptual models. We can vary the geologic framework, the initial and boundary conditions, the scenarios, the processes that are included, even whether it's one, two, or three dimensions, or what software we use to represent the system. And if you have a number of variations of all these things and then combine them all, that ends up to be quite a lot of models. And it can be a bit overwhelming. You know that time and money are limiting. And so we can just do the best we can at this point. I might point out you already have many alternative models on your computer. Rarely does anyone use the same model at the end of a project as they used at the beginning. So those can be considered. And Nowadays, generating alternatives uh, requires only a limited effort. Because we have GUIs that can help us to change the conceptual model and rebuild the numerical model, and we have automated calibration tools that can calibrate them, we can get multiple models going while we're busy working on other things. And we really only want to consider notably different models. We don't want to make a small tweak to a model and recalibrate and include that in the weight. We want the big changes in the concepts. So when we think about how we can delineate these alternative models, it's certainly a topic of research at this time. But while we're in this position, we can, during development of our model, make note of all the assumptions. And those offer alternatives. We should always consider those things that are most uncertain or most contentious. And we should use the results of model work that we do along the way to give us ideas for alternative conceptual models. But most importantly, we should definitely ask our stakeholders for their contributions. Sometimes these seem unreasonable because the stakeholders aren't our scientists. 
but every model is going to be evaluated for its consistency with the data. And so if their suggestion is truly unreasonable, it should come out with a low weight. And if it doesn't, we can ask ourselves, did we work with our blinders on? What are we missing? Or is it that we don't have the proper data to discriminate against this model? So whatever we do, the model set is going to be incomplete. We lack data, we lack imagination, and science changes on us. So for example, if we were trying to make a geologic model or a nuclear physics model back in the 60s, we might leave out plate tectonics or quarks. But I just say, well, let's not give up because perfection is the enemy of good, and we need to move forward with what we are able to do today. And we also need to remember that in 1890, Chamberlain said to us to use working, multiple working hypotheses this was the fastest way to resolve both practical and theoretical problems. And we sort of lost track of that along the way when we're zeroing in on this one representation of our groundwater system to make a decision. Now, I believe that the level of effort we have to put into this is going to vary. So as we have the severity of consequence of our model being wrong increasing, or the potential for omitting something from our model increasing, then we have to do more effort on model development. So if, for example, we're working with failed backyard septic systems, maybe the level of effort could be low. Intermediate level of effort for working with open pit mine and landfill problems. And of course, the highest level of effort for working with our nuclear waste disposal, because there we'll probably never have a complete set of models. And if we decide to go forward with disposal, we'll need to keep monitoring and be ready to take the waste out of the ground if we see a problem developing. But in short, I'd like to point out that whether it's politics or relationships or groundwater modeling, we tend to spend about 5% of our time trying to decide what we think and then 95% of our time convincing everybody that we're right. And I'm encouraging us to flip that around. Let's spend 95% of our time trying to determine what the conceptual model is and only 5% of our time defending that. And let's be very transparent in that process so that everybody can evaluate our models and try their own alternative models. Now there are a number of problems we face. There's controversy over which methods are appropriate and the new methods are very slow at getting out to practitioners. And so I've been working with a group of people on some tools uh, called the Jupyter API and associated applications to try to get through this problem. Jupyter stands for Joint Universal Parameter Identification and Evaluation of Reliability and that's a bit long so just try to remember Jupyter if you're looking for it on the web. And it's public domain open source code. Jupyter itself does not make any computations for it. It's for programmers to develop codes for the types of tasks that we've talked about today. Sensitivity analysis, data needs assessment, calibration, uncertainty evaluation, and optimization. And I've worked with a number of people on this. Ned Banta, John Doherty, Mary Hill, Justin Babendreyer, and Carl Castleton. And we've tried to coordinate with a number of agencies in hopes that at some point we'll all have a standard data structure to work with. Now, Jupyter itself facilitates efforts on two levels. First, for the programmer, it offers modules so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel for all the busy work. And all they have to do is focus on the algorithm that's pertinent to the application that they're, of in they're interested in. And then, because they use the Jupyter modules, all the data input and output are consistent. And so for the users to use another application, they simply need to put in a few extra parameters for that particular application, but all their data is already in the structure to use an alternative Jupyter application, and their output is ready to be used with post-processors. Now, you might want to use or add codes, and I have to warn you that this is text-based, uh, command window-based type software, so if you're interested in using the codes and you aren't oriented towards this type of text-based, command windows-based programming, then ask your GUI developer to incorporate the data structure for Jupyter applications in their GUI so that you can use those applications. Let me just show you a little bit about what the programmer has to do. I, for example, took UCode and put it into Jupyter. That's when it became UCode 2005. And as you know, with universal calibration codes like UCode or PEST, we have to run our process model many times from the code. And so the Jupyter modules do all the work of setting up the files and running the model and getting the, the results out. And all I have to do is focus on the algorithm right in the middle that does the nonlinear regression and estimates the parameters. So if you had set up your um, files to run the U-code application, then you could take 
the John Doherty pest version of Jupiter, and you would automatically, with a few adding a few parameters, you would be able to run that calibration. Hopefully, someone will put in a shuffle complex.